father, producer, instrumentalist, lyricist, and educator. Born in Hollis, Queens, it was there that he honed his craft, producing superstars like Erica Badu, Jay-Z, Kanye West, Ice-T, Rick Ross, and a host of others, resulting in millions of records sold, as well as earning a highly coveted Grammy Award. Three-time Grammy-nominated songwriter and producer, Ivan Barrios, goes under the hood. We don't have to really get into like all the people you work with, but you work with some heavy hitters. Yeah. And, and in that process, you've been recognized for your work. You, you won Grammys. I won a Grammy for sure. What did that Grammy do for you? Did it change all my What it just did was make me feel so good to have the heavy hardware in my possession. I don't know if it wasn't. Like on the comedy side of things, your mind goes, yo, we about to get this money. All of it. And then on a very pragmatic side of things, you you see it for what it is an item that can break. It's already, it's already chipped. It's disposable. Then you meet people who say, I don't give a fuck about that fucking gravity. So that's a very that's a that's a that's a serious reality check. Mm -hmm. I was more selfish as a young producer though. As a versatile producer, you gotta know how to do both. It's time for both. But I was almost solely focused on my vision as a producer, um, which got me into some trouble, you know, when you're a little young and you're asking somebody to cut the vocal again, sing it like this. <laughs> Stars be looking at like, yo, 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 young buck. Because you're alluding to a kind of a different, like a higher, Understanding of the production game is what I got a little bit later, where you're kind of where you were where you're itching at. It didn't get more elevated like this. Understanding to help to bring out the best in a human it being. Didn't, it, it didn't become polished right away. Nah, I was too focused on just trying to get everything in and make it sound like how I want to sound, which my sound was still being it was still developing. Did that set you back? And, you know, it didn't set me back, but um, well, it allowed me also to have conflicts with people. See, this is the nature of, I guess, one's formative years, is that it allowed me to have those conflicts to learn how to be better. Because it isn't, it ain't like records wasn't getting done. It made you just a little bit longer to get them done. But did those conflicts make people say, oh, don't rock with that dude at or say, yo, rock with all He brought out the best out of me. What was, which yeah. one of those two was? Well, this, let me just add it with all due respect. This may be another era, uh, this may be another aspect of it where it's like, you know what? He's good at what he does. Maybe more like that. Because uh, sometimes it's like, you don't always fuck with people like that. Instead of like, yo, we fuck with them, we don't. It's more like, you know, whatever quirky little things he got, that's cool. Because the shit was good. So we just, we'll deal with that. You were surrounded by like, all this jazz. Not just jazz, we're talking about, you know, the, the gatekeepers of the culture. The luminaries of jazz luminaries cultures. Who shifted the culture. But yet, you're growing up in the mecca of, of hip hop. So you have this interesting juxtaposition between the jazz yeah. that you're growing up around, but at the same time, your interest is being uh, peaked by <clears throat> hip hop. Very peaked. In the 80s. Whoa. What was that like? I can really just pretty much liken this all to having seen Beat Street in the theater for the first time. That was it. I was trying to be a graffiti writer and I have absolutely, I have very little abilities with my hands freestyle with drawing. So how do we get from, um, hey, you know, this, this is my entry, my entry to the culture. I want to I wanna, I wanna do whole cars. But yet, somehow, I ended up becoming this producer. Yo, guess what happened? We had this weird little all-in-one, I guess what we call now a karaoke box, but it was a record player, and two cassette decks. And I guess what I really started doing was making um, cassette Cassette loop beats. You was making pause button tapes. I was making pause button tapes as a necessity. Couldn't do it with the vinyl that I was having. And of course, I guess I was honing my skills as a needle dropper as well. And I DJ still, you know. At 11, I was obviously liking sections. So it was only my understanding of mechanism that made me think that I could do something with the music. I was like, oh. <laughs> One of the main things that happened in between all this was when Gary Bartz came to live in my house. And you know, my mother's kind of a patient of the arts. Music is my sanctuary. Music is my arts. sanctuary, you know? 
So after after Gary left, his son moved in. Farid. Farid had techniques. He had a pair of techniques and a pioneer mixer and a, and a current jazz, a current music collection that had nothing to do with jazz. He didn't listen to jazz. He ain't fucking with his. He wasn't fucking with none of that shit. So he had Eric B and Rakim. He had Eric B and Rakim, Spoonie G, Prince, The Police, Smiley Culture, Def Leppard, The Doors, Planet Rock, Every Run DMC. He had, he had a, actually he had an eclectic current edgy collection. Billy Idol. The reason why I love Billy Idol to this day is because of Farid. <clears throat> I gotta tell the story. I'm sorry. Ice T made Cop Killer. It resonated so big that the board of Warner had a discussion about this recording and we got that big at Warner. We were signed to Warner. So the content of the first album that we did with Rob Reed was deemed in line with Ice's stuff. And as a courtesy, instead of dropping us, they gave us a whole nother 350,000 to do a whole new album after the whole LA experience. So we came back, I was like 19. We moved to Harlem all together. We had the Mackie 32 channel board, eight bus console, three ADATs, Fender Rhodes, World Series set of drums, S950, SP12, MPC 3000, and Sonic ESI 32. That was the whole setup. And we had a C414. And we're using the board for the mic previous. And having all that gear, for some reason, one day I got a spark and I decided to start to, to write or to want to write a song and sing it. I think I was 19. While juggling a new family, a day job, and making music, Omas experienced that ultimate blessing in disguise, a pink slip from his corporate job. This major life change consequently gave him the chance he needed to seriously consider moving to Los Angeles and forming the mighty Sara. This job was taking was was consuming my life because I was making so much money with a health insurance plan with a brand new baby. Yeah, yeah. security. It was ill. I've never had that in my whole life ever again. It was one time where I experienced what it meant to have a day job and have Oxford Health Insurance and all this. But the whole thing was the call lined right up with my departure in that in in, in the form of the pink slip. Then the pink slip came the day I got fired. I told my daughter's mother, I said, I gotta go to LA. I got with, I got with Shafiq and Taz. They knew I was, they knew I was Om Sun Ra. It was, you know, it was all higher sciences and we formed Sara. You coming from a, a certain generation that typically doesn't embrace this current generation fully. I know. How, how did that happen? What was it about you that made you say, you know, I can engage them, I can... Sarah is the reason why the youth fuck with us because my music with Sarah is youthful inherently and remains that way for all for all time because we recorded it, we archived it, and we recorded a, a, a slice of our life that is always going to sound that way. Inspired is what I was by, mm. you know, by Sarah. I think inspired is, is a much more fitting word. Looking at the timeline, it will put you squarely in the middle of the West Coast Renaissance in terms of shifting the culture. Sonic. Dre. And, and you were around all of that. I was trying to make beats like that because when the beats came out, I was like, yo, get the novation. Had to have the novation. Yo, because we used to be in the studio like tweaking hi-hats. You tweak your mixes to sound like them Dre mixes. Because it's like, oh, we just we gotta be crispy. Coming from the bricks, come from New York, is a certain sound, a right out of the machine sound. Right out the machine. And New York had an interesting style that was, you know, a derivative of a lot of the records that we grew up on. Like, you know, New York was a heavy breakbeat culture. Not only were you take either you taking loops, but we were chopping stuff and then we'll sample stuff and filter stuff, make bass lines out of samples. That, 100%. You know, you have it. Do it from the turntables just and sample it in with the bass off in the... And the musicality in New York wasn't necessarily one where cats were, you know, proficient on instruments to the level where they can say, we don't need to sample, but we still, we still, we still can make records comparable to samples. Mm -hmm. Here on the West Coast, those guys were like influenced by Parliament and Bootsy and, and Roger. You can hear it in their music. I know. And you you were able to marry the two cultures. 
Yeah, I mean, New York formed me though. Q-Tip, he formed my sonic, uh, he, he formed my opinion. Like records like the Jungle Brothers, Forces of Nature, first three tribe records, playing on cassette every day on the train. That formed my, I don't know, that formed my sound. You, you give freely of your energy to the people you collaborate with. And I think as producers and songwriters and creators behind the scenes, we carve out a sizable piece of our own, you know, soul and, and magic, and we give it to somebody else mm -hmm. to, to, to enhance their, their magic that they're gonna share with their audience. How do you balance that, knowing that sometimes it's not reciprocal? I kind of expect everything of everyone, always prepared for the worst. So I'm like, that allows me to push on through a lot of stuff that may be uncomfortable in the creative environments or whatever things that happen in the real world of record producing, which are discrepancies and conflicts and stuff like that. The lack of reciprocity is just that, it's unfairness. So you pretty reconciled? I, I guess so, huh? I never thought of it that way either, man. Thank you for so the you, I pre reconcile, yeah. When would you feel fulfilled and say, this is my, this is, I'm content now. The quest is over, I painted my Picasso, when is that? I don't know, I never want to stop making music. I don't want to start, I don't never want to stop being a producer, man. I know I have a list of things that include things like having ensured that I provide for generations to come of my family. That's like a crowning achievement on one's life, to have ensured that with a trust that ensures a payout for everybody. A true financial independence. Right. I wouldn't want for anyone that's up under me in my immediate family to have to go through things that I went through. So part of why I'm operating in the transactional world of the music business is to ensure that. Because really music and art should be conflict free because the demonstration and creation of music is pure, it comes out of you anyway in its purest form. So you get with that. For me, I would think to myself, was there not a time when an F minor nine chord made me feel so good that I just wanted to play that? And I was happy with the sound of it. It sounds like really foofy foofy and simple, but that's real shit. <laughs>